Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us from your homes. Today is the second week that Murai has suspended our physical worship and have gone online completely in light of the COVID-19 situation. Now, these are dark times, but the faithful exposition of God's Word cannot and should not be stopped. And in fact, we need to dig even deeper, dig our roots even deeper so as to be nourished. And that's why we are carrying on with our sermons on 1 Samuel. And today we are going to start on 1 Samuel chapter 9. But before I do that, you know, let me just uh, give you a story. So there was this uh, poor Chinese farmer, you know, and this poor Chinese farmer, he just owns one horse. So one day that, that horse ran away and, and cannot be found. And the farmer's neighbors came to him and said, Oh, my friend, I'm so sorry for your bad news. And the farmer said, Bad news, good news, who knows? Time will tell. And a few weeks later, the horse returned and he brought with it another wild horse. Again, this neighbor came and, and said, Congratulations on your good news. The farmer responded, Good news, bad news, who knows? Time will tell. The farmer gave this new horse to the son who rode it around in the countryside. And one day, the wild horse buckled. The, the child fell and, and broke his leg. And the neighbor came, walked by, and they said, Oh, my friend, I'm so sorry, your, friend, your son broke his leg. Definitely, this must be bad news. The farmer said, Bad news, good news, who knows, right? Time will tell. And a few weeks later, the emperor of China declared war. And then he sent all his troops to forcefully conscript young men to serve as soldiers. But then when they come to this farmer's son, they let him stay with the family because his leg was broken. Good news or bad news? Now, this story is taken from Taoism. And the principle behind it is that we cannot judge too quickly when good things or bad things happen to us. And the final outcome can only be seen in time. While this is true, Christianity offers a different perspective to this story. So let us turn to 1 Samuel chapter 9, chapter 1, sorry, 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1 to chapter 10, verse 16. And here we are going to see this passage of bad news and good news to see who God is and how knowing God helps us to deal with life. Now let's recall what happened in chapter 8. The people of Israel, they, they demand a king to rule over them. They did not ask for a king for a right reason. Their hearts were not in the right place, but God was still going to grant them their request. And chapter 8 ended with Samuel dismissing all the men of Israel in order to make preparations for the appointment of a king. And today, chapter 9, we are going to see how Israel's first king is chosen. Now, in the first two verses of 1 Samuel chapter 9, we read of a man, Kish. He's the son of Abel, son of Zorah, son of Bekorah, son of Aphaiah, from the tribe of Benjamin. And the way that you know, his genealogy was elaborated showed that this man is a man with a solid pedigree, and he was wealthy. And he had a son, Saul. And you know, Saul would have been like Mr. Israel. You know, this young man, our text here, described him as being incredibly handsome and tall. He cuts an imposing figure and he stands far, far out, you know, stands out among the rest of the Israelite men. So imagine this, this tall stature, you know, broad soldiers, handsome features. Just imagine your favorite Korean actor and you know what I mean. Ah. So verse 3 starts with bad news. Kish donkeys were lost and, and so he told his son Saul to take one of the servants and look for the missing donkeys. Now donkeys were all-purpose animals. They were used for transporting people or goods or even for farming. So to own many donkeys is, is a show of wealth. To lose them is actually a bad news and a disaster. So Saul and the servant, you know, they searched everywhere. They searched Ephraim, Shalisha, Shalim, Land of Benjamin and so forth. They really searched. The whole area itself is about 40 kilometers by 20 kilometers. That's half of Singapore, maybe? Right? And it's not an easy terrain, right? Saul will have to climb up and down Ephraim's hilly terrain and the western mountains. They have to look into every nook and cranny, ask every stranger they come across, have you seen my donkeys? And the search could have taken them days, which is why you know, Saul said in verse 5 to the servant that was with him, he said, 
okay enough you know that's it we have looked everywhere let's go back let's gi just give my dad the bad news eh? because otherwise he's going to worry about us but the servant said to him wait wait wait, wait, wait. i think i have good news in this city lives a man of god this prophet okay and people look up to him because whatever he says come true he brings god's word so why not check and see whether he's around ask him and maybe he can tell us where to go but saul said to the, to the servant oh bad news you know i i finished everything you know i finished all the bread in our sex we don't have anything to offer this this man of god and then the servant answered saul wait wait, wait. i found this quarter or shackled of silver and i can give this to the man of god praise god you know good news he can tell us where our donkeys are so they went up to the hill into the city towards the city where the man of god is and they came across some young women who gave them good news the man of god is in town verse 12 it says behold he is just ahead of you hurry he has just come now to the city because the people have a sacrifice today on the high place as soon as you enter the city you will find him because before he he goes up to the high place to eat for the people will not eat until he comes since he must bless the sacrifice afterward those who are invited will eat now go up for you will meet him immediately so they went up to the city and as they were entering the city they saw samuel coming out of, towards them on his way up to the high place okay let's just take a moment and just breathe okay all the things that has happened here are ordinary things there's no mention of god right there's no mention of anything here losing some donkeys you know asking people hey have you found my donkeys you know searching the hill country giving up when you can't find them asking a prophet you know do you know where my donkeys are happening to find the, the, the quarter of uh, silver for the prophet's fee you know all these things that happen these are ordinary stuff but was it just coincidence is it just a mixture of good news and bad news that somehow led Saul to meet with Samuel or was it divinely ordained verse 15 reveals a clue now the day before Samuel came the Lord had revealed sorry the day before Saul came the Lord had revealed to Samuel tomorrow about this time I will send to you a man from the land of Benjamin and you shall anoint him to be prince over my people Israel and this sentence alone changed the entire perspective of the story which we have just read because it is no longer coincidence that the donkeys got lost it is not a coincidence that Kish asked his son Saul to go and find the missing donkeys and to bring along this particular young man it was also no coincidence that no matter how much he tried to find in, in the whole of Benjamin, land of Benjamin, they could not find the donkeys. It was no coincidence that Saul actually gave up searching very near to the city where this man of God, Samuel, would be. It was no coincidence that this young man with Saul, he knew and he remembered that a prophet was near, was in that city. No coincidence that they, he managed, he actually seems to have some silver to give. It was no coincidence that as he went up the hill towards the city, this woman came down just at the right time who knew the location of the prophet and urged them to hurry and it was no coincidence that the first person they they meet when they enter the city was none other than the man of god samuel himself so what appears to be a series of luck or coincidence is actually under god's direction this is a story that has god and god alone as the author Saul was sent chosen and revealed by god to samuel and the question is this why did god work in such a way why can't god just tell samuel where saul is you know he stays here poster code whatever 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 just go and find him get him as king why can't god just supernaturally intervene you know the way that he has always done so in the past maybe get a donkey to talk to saul right say hey you have been chosen you have been anointed or send a chariot of fire to to bring Saul to Samuel so why did God use the mundane details of finding these missing donkeys to work up this divine decree of leadership and, and deliverance to the people of Israel 
God chose to work this way because He is not just a God of supernatural intervention. He is a God of providence. Always and in all things, even the smallest things. By providence here, I mean the mysterious, unknown, yet amazing way that God governed this world and, and, and uphold the people and, and, and His will acting frequently over, under and, and around us in spite of the ordering things in our life or even against, at times, the biasness of our wills. You know, there's this uh, professor of New Testament Greek and Greek exegesis, uh, Karen Jobs, and, and she said this. She said, beneath the surface of even insignificant human decision events, there is an unseen and uncontrollable power at work that can be neither explained nor trotted. God advanced His purposes even in the mundane things of our life. Maybe you're thinking, of course, la, this is Israel and, and Israel needs a king. This is an epic moment in, in salvation history. Of course, God is going to act. But what about me? Who am I? Is God acting through the ordinary events of my life? Of my boring life? Well, the wisdom of Proverbs 16.9 reminds us that the heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord established his steps. And Proverbs 20.24 20, also says, A man's steps are barred from the Lord. How then can man understand his way? And what we can understand from these two verses is that, you know, God's providence isn't limited to the, to the elite of, of, of Christianity, to the kings and the queens and the prophets that he needed to fulfill his redemption or salvation plan. It's not the exclusive privilege of giants of faith like C.S. Lewis, John Piper, Tim Keller, Paul Washer, but his providence is for each and every one of us no matter how ordinary we are, no matter how small our faith may seem to be. You know, we may not be able to see currently what God is doing in our lives, but we know that God has a purpose for us. God has a purpose for Saul and for Israel. And for Saul, in, in, we see in verse 16, his purpose is to save the Israelites from the hand of the Philistines because God has sinned his people, because their cry has come out to him. Let's recall last week's sermon by, or rather, two weeks ago sermon by Deacon Mervyn. Israel rejected God. They wanted a physical king. They wanted to be like the other cultures and nations around them. They wanted to be on the right side of history. They rejected Yahweh. They rejected God. But their rejection did not paralyze God's providence. God still hear their distress and cries, and God acted with compassion. This is providence as moved by compassion for his people. This is God being faithful despite our wickedness. This is God showing mercy despite our sins. And here I remember a couple of verses. You know, Romans 9, 22 24 says, you know, what if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath? prepared for destruction, in order to make known the riches of His glory for vessels of mercy, which He had prepared beforehand for glory. As well as Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Or do you presume on the riches of His kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you into repentance? This is providence as moved by His compassion for His people. Let's carry on to verse 17. And here in chapter 9, verse 17, we read that Saul and Samuel, they met for the first time. And God informed Samuel that, you know, this young man will be the, the one that will restrain my people. And this is an interesting verb to use. It indicates shall control. And it's a word that look ahead to Saul's future because he will be a very stern and severe ruler. Then Samuel immediately said, Saul's mind is about the missing donkeys. They have been found, you know, he said. You don't have to worry about them because there's actually greater things we need to discuss. So Samuel invited Saul and his servant to the banquet at that evening at a high place outside of town and they talked. And the next morning, Samuel prepared Saul to receive a private word from God by asking that he send his servant ahead of them. That's in verse 27. And then once alone, Samuel then anointed Saul. 
chapter 10, verse 1, we read, Has not the Lord anointed you to be the prince over his people Israel? And you shall reign over the people of the Lord and shall save them from the hand of their surrounding enemies. And this shall be the sign to you that the Lord has anointed you to be his prince over his heritage. Samuel said that there will be a sign to Saul. In fact, there will be several parts to this sign. And he gave him an overview of the signs that to come and it's going to be a day to remember. Now firstly, near Rachel's tomb at the border of Benjamin, Saul will meet two men who will tell him that Kish donkeys have been found and his father was very sick for him. Good news. Secondly, Saul will meet three men on their way to worship at Bethel and they will be bringing all the things for, for sacrifice, you know, three young goats, three loaves of bread, skin of wine. And these young men will ask about how Saul is doing and they will actually give him two loaves of bread. And lastly, when he reached Gebel, they will, he will encounter a group of prophets who are coming down from the high, high place. They will be strumming their kitas, playing their lutes. They will be singing and giving glory to God. And the Spirit of God, it was written here, will rush into Saul. He will join in their prophesying. He will, as verse 5 and 6 mention, turn into another man. Now, in verse 9, B, we see actually all these signs that, that Samuel has predicted came true. Okay? It all happened. And these are signs that were very detailed. It's not some general fortune telling that, oh, you know, you're going to meet someone new today whose surname starts with L. Okay? But it was detailed to the location, it was detailed to the kind of people that he's meeting, it was detailed to what they were doing, even the kind of interaction that Saul is going to have with them. Now these promises and then the fulfillment therein can only come from the God Almighty. This sign should actually show a sign to, to Saul that you know he actually had God's authorization for kingship and God's power to carry out the demands of kingship. These are actually promises meant to reassure Saul. You know, the word of God is also meant to show God's providence and to assure us as well. Brothers and sisters, you know, we can argue and say, you know, of course, this is Saul, right? The king of Israel. And, and, and these promises, these signs, these, these assurances are unique to him. True. But what about us? You know, what promises, what assurance do we as followers of Christ have to claim? In the Bible, there's many, many promises, okay? I will just focus on a few. One promise that we have is about the promise that God is good. Psalm 34 verse 8 tells us that to taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in Him. There's a promise that God is with us. Joshua 1 9 says that the Lord our God will be with us wherever we go. And a promise that God will provide for our every need. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8 reminds us that God will bless us abundantly and that all things at all times we have we have all that we need and we are abound in every good work. And there are many, many more. The wonderful thing is that when we meditate on God's word, when we meditate on these promises, you will learn and we start to discover more of who God is. We learn that our God is a good God who cares for his creation. That our God is a personal God who is with us through, the, through the, both the valleys and the mountains of our life. Our God is a faithful provider he gives us all we need in life and, and works all things for good. Now, the Taoist parable that we heard at the start of this sermon, it makes an observation of what life is like. While this is true, as I mentioned earlier, Christianity shares a different perspective to this story. Because as Christians, we do not just simply look at things, whether they are good or bad. Instead, the Word of God tells us that we need to observe the world through the glasses of knowing the person of God. So the question we need to ask ourselves today is this. What about God helps us to deal with life? And this is the answer that we want to know, especially with the COVID-19 that is affecting all aspects of our life today. You know, some of you have experienced great inconveniences and sudden changes to your travel plans as overseas work trips get cancelled, holiday trips get cancelled, can't even go to Malaysia now, the border is closed. You know, even your overseas exchanges or overseas studies are disrupted. Some of you may face retrenchment as companies decide to let go of staff whom they deem as non-essential. 
And for those of you who retain your job, maybe you face criticism because you come for church, right? You still come for church. Okay, for the last okay, few months back, you still come for church. You still come for fellowship. You still gather. And maybe your colleagues accuse you of, you know, not being socially responsible. Maybe some of you face constant fear and instability of life as, as your friends, colleagues, your relatives, people you know get water in hospital and, and you don't know why. And you're worried about the elderly and the young in your family. You're worried that you yourself may be sick and you can't take care of them. Or maybe frustration amounts when the childcare is closed and the children have now have to change over and take home-based learning. Parents are forced to work from home, take no pay leave. At the same time, you take care of a baby that's crying. Or maybe there's conflicts between the maid and the employers. And of course, it's a half a million cases of patients around the world who's infected with COVID-19. And the 25,000 deaths as of today. All these things are happening and maybe there's another group of people, you know, brothers and sisters who will argue and, and they will say, they will point to Romans 8, 28 to say, all these things that happen, you know, work together for our good. And they mentioned about how this period is a period of testing for the believers, right? How we manage to hold tight to what is sacred and hold loosely everything else as we redefine the way we worship God. How churches have gathered together to produce, you know, and, and, and prepare and pack care packages, pack care packages for our healthcare workers. Or how we have, within the couple of weeks, you know, we have learned to use technology. We, used to, we learned to use Zoom to meet together, to encourage, to worship online, or, or to even to pray online. So there is some good. But are there enough good in what happened in this COVID-19 to justify the frustration, the pain, the suffering, the death and the eternity apart from God for some, for those who lost their lives, or for children who lost their fathers, or for mothers who lost their children. How can a sovereign God of providence, of ultimate good and wisdom, be justified in light of COVID-19? And the truth is, I don't know. You know, I, I really ultimately don't know. But I believe that this, is, this was a question that Israel might have asked in the later chapters. Because Saul, we know, he was crowned king of Israel. And that seemed like good news, right? But he was actually a bad news king. Saul continued to take matters into his own hand. Within a few short chapters, by chapter 15, he was rejected by God as king. And the spirit of the Lord left him in chapter 16. Israel would have asked, how can a sovereign God, a providential God, a God who say he has chosen us as his people, a compassionate God, why would he anoint Saul as king over us? But the truth is this. You and I, Israel, we weren't there when God created the world. We weren't there when he flung the stars across the heavens, when he defined the boundaries for the oceans. We don't understand a lot of things in the world today. We don't understand how our body works, you know. N not everything about ourselves, about DNA, we can understand. We don't understand how is it that sometimes we know exactly what is the right thing to do and yet somehow we act in a way that is contrary. And if we ourselves, we are unable to understand the basics of creation, unable to understand even ourselves, what makes us think that we can understand the infinite permutations of the providence of an eternal God who created this universe with a word? God alone declares the end from the beginning. He alone declares what tomorrow brings. Are we too quick to judge God's providence by what we see around us? When he chose Saul to be king and when he allowed COVID-19 to happen, you know, perhaps we need to pause and not just jump to easy and quick answers as to why bad news happened to us. We know the ending to Saul's story because it's written in the Bible. We know that he was bad news as a king, but God still used him and he paved the way for King David, the good news, and for the ultimate good news. The ultimate good news that is for our good and for God's glory. And the ultimate good news actually involves one of the worst acts 
of evil the world has ever known. The worst piece of bad news. The murder of the Son of God. In that instance, Jesus Christ took part of our frustration, of our pain, of our suffering, and of the separation between himself and God, and by his perfect obedience to the point of death, the life-giving power of God was demonstrated and sin in his resurrection. And the ultimate bad news was turned into the eternal good news. 2,000 years later, we are still seeing glorious and beautiful good coming out of that bad news. People's lives were transformed to be like Christ as they embrace and enter into the kingdom of God. The gospel itself proves it. God's wisdom, His compassion, His goodness, His providential will be all to be justified. So today, we have an ultimate good in Jesus Christ that we know has been won for us. So let's just let's not keep our eyes, you know, just on the COVID-19 situation. But instead, let's fix our eyes on God, the God of power and of love who is working through the pages of history and, and through the good and the bad things in our life that ultimately lead to the good of redeeming us. Let me end with a short story. You know, there was this uh, father who was bringing his daughter to, the, to her first ever swimming lesson. And this little girl, she, she stood with the rest of the class and she has those inflatable arm floaties and a swimming float. And one by one, you know, as the instructor told them to jump into the pool, all of them jump in, all but this daughter. So as she stood at the side, her arms were full up, her eyes looked red, and the coach was like shaking his head in defeat. The father knew that he had to step up. So he got into the pool. And by the way, he wasn't in his swimming trunks, he was in his business suit, okay? He got into the pool, and then he waddled close to the side where the daughter was standing, standing up there, and he just beckoned to her. And then she just jumped in with a big splash. The father was caught underwear, you know, the daughter actually drank a bit of her swimming pool water before the father was able to grab hold of her. So after the class was over and, and while driving back home, the father asked the daughter, why didn't you jump in earlier? You know, you have your arm floaties, you have all, this, all these things. Why didn't you jump in earlier? But, and, and again, why did you jump the moment I was beckoning to you? Why did you just jump like that? Okay, and the daughter just replied simply, because you are there in the swimming pool. You know, may our faith be built on, you know, not on the things that we see around us, not on the good news or the bad news that we see around us, but may our, our faith be built on God, God alone. He who has given us the ultimate good news, that is Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word to us today. And truly, Lord, you are a providential God. You are God who is all-powerful and you work behind the scenes for our good. Not just any good, but for the ultimate good of redeeming us. And Lord, I know that currently now we are all frightened, we are all insecure, we are all frustrated at the situation that COVID has brought on us. But Lord, as this as your word reminds us today, help us to keep our eyes on you, the ultimate good news. Help us to keep our thoughts on you, Lord. May you bless us and let your word, Lord, take root within us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.